starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Welcome back, everyone. I had a little wardrobe change from the intro. Turns out the dress I was wearing was <laughs> forged by the fires of hell or something because that sucker did not breathe and I was sweating like a sinner on Sunday. So I had to change it up. Anyway, I'm really happy that you enjoyed my episode on Rosin Hazel because old Hollywood and black history are literally my most favorite things to talk about, except old radio and maybe beauty. <laughs> so I'm going to share another of my favorite stories with you. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about two of my most favorite Hollywood comedians, Jack Benny and Eddie Rochester Anderson and how together they help to combat racial prejudice and fundamentally change the status quo of comedy. But first, I'm gonna give you a little backstory on The Jack Benny Show, so you're gonna get a little old-time radio and television history today. The Jack Benny Program starred Jack Benny and was a comedy series that was on both radio and television and ran for more than three decades. Jack played the straight man and a caricature of himself as a terrible violinist and miser who was the butt of all jokes. His comedic foil was Rochester Van Jones, his butler slash valet, who eventually became one of the primary people to rib Jack. This was very unusual for the time as most roles available to black actors had them playing the fool or were played by white actors in blackface. <laughs> Talk about you, Amos and Andy. Eddie Anderson was the first actual black man to have a recurring role in a national radio show, which I think is pretty awesome. I'm going to get back to the show and Eddie and Jack's dynamic a bit later on in the episode, but first, let's talk about Eddie Anderson, the man behind the Rochester character. So, let's step into our Wayback Machine and turn that dial to 1905 Oakland where Eddie Anderson was born. Eddie was born into a show business family. His father was a minstrel performer, while his mother was a circus tightrope walker until she broke her back and had to retire. Anderson earned his very recognizable foghorn type voice while selling newspapers as a young boy. Let's take a listen. Mr. Benny, wake up. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, boss, it's time to get up. Come on, open your baby blue eyes and look at me. <laughs> there. Now, here's your teeth. Smile at me. Eddie entered show business at the age of 14, primarily singing and dancing through the 1920s in a vaudeville show with his brother, Cornelius. Anderson relocated to Hollywood in the 1930s and found work as a dancer at the Cotton Club in Culver City, California. He did some bit parts in movies and theater, plus he did some nightclub and radio work. His first notable films during this time were Three Men on a Horse in 1935 and Showboat, which was done in 1936. So he had stage and film experience by 1937 when he first appeared on the Jack Benny program as a Pullman car porter. His first gig on the show was supposed to be a one-off, but his comic chemistry with Jack was evident and he was called back and eventually he received so much fan mail that he was brought in as a regular and became Rochester Van Jones. Jack's personal ballet. The early shows with the Rochester character were more in line with how black domestic workers were portrayed at the time. The stereotyping of black characters was unfortunately standard practice, and white actors in blackface would reinforce stereotypes of laziness, illiteracy, drunkenness, gambling, and were often portrayed as incapable of holding any leadership type roles. The episodes focused on Rochester's attempts to avoid work, go to Central Avenue to drink, and to gamble. However, by 1945, the character had evolved into a wisecracking smartass who constantly needled his boss, prickled his fragile little ego, and chided him for his cheapness. This change came about as Jack became more cognizant of what can happen when incorrect or inflammatory stereotypes are reinforced, and he didn't want to be a part of the ilk that treated those of different races or religious affiliations as less than. I love that. It's actually one of the reasons Eddie didn't tour with Jack overseas. Jack wasn't okay with the segregated barracks, super uncomfortable, amongst other things, uh, and his attitude carried on in the States. Jack refused to stay at any hotel that Eddie wasn't welcome in, and had been known to rebook the entire cast at a different hotel if the proprietors adhered to the segregation rules of the time. 
Eddie did travel with Jack to stateside military bases and hospitals to perform, though, and he often received the most applause of any cast member. That said, while the servicemen love the Rochester character, some wouldn't socialize or meet him due to their own prejudices. Don't you worry, though. Jack was down with the brown and wouldn't socialize with any servicemen that didn't treat Eddie as a respected member of the cast. When the war was over, Jack and his writers did their darndest to remove all stereotypical aspects from the Rochester character, and by 1950, Jack made his writers guarantee that no racial jokes or references would be heard on his show. Jack also gave key guest star appearances to African-American performers, such as my favorite, Louis Armstrong, and Thanks Spots, also great. Plus, he made a plethora of appeals on his show, asking for listeners to reject racism. This was a huge deal for the time and fundamentally helped change the status quo for comedy. This, I think, is evident based on the casting of another show I mentioned earlier, Amos and Andy. The original radio show was done by two white gents, Charles Carell and Freeman Gosden. But by the time the show was adapted to television in 1951, it cast actual black actors because <laughs> no one wanted to see two white dudes in blackface playing their favorite characters. Anyway, back to Eddie. Becoming a regular cast member of the show afforded him a lot of opportunities not generally available to African Americans at the time. Not long after he became a regular on the show, Anderson opened up a nightclub in the Central Avenue section of Los Angeles. Unfortunately, <laughs> didn't last long because he was way too generous with the homies and, you know, constantly comping everything and he had to close because the club wasn't making any money. <laughs> During World War II, Anderson was the owner of the Pacific Parachute Company, an African-American owned and operated business that made parachutes for the Army and Navy. He also managed a boxer, Billy Metcalf, in the 1940s and became the honorary mayor of Central Avenue. Which is super cool. Eddie also had time to star in a few films. He was in the 1945 version of Brewster's Millions, and he played a starring role as Joseph Little Joe Jackson in Cabin in the Sky. Plus, he played Topper's butler in Topper Returns. <laughs> oh, also, he provided his voice for one of my favorite Warner Brothers cartoon shorts, and it's called The Mouse That Jack Built. It's a cartoon that portrays the rodent versions of the show's characters. It is great. I'll post a link to the short in the description for you. Anderson's last big feature film performance was as one of the taxi drivers in Stanley Kramer's 1963 comedy, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, and Jack Benny made a cameo appearance, but they didn't appear together. After the Jack Benny television show left the air, Eddie worked as a trainer at the Hollywood Park racetrack for fun until shortly before his death. He was also elected into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame in 1975 and unfortunately died of heart disease a few years later on February 28, 1977. He left his home in his will with the direction that it be used to help reform substance abusers and the Rochester House opened its doors in 1989. It's dedicated in memory of Eddie Anderson and still open today. And there you go, kids. That's the story of Eddie Rochester Anderson and Jack Benny and how together they were able to help shape the world of comedy for the better. As always, if you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. I've got some more interesting goodies for you, so I hope to see you for my next episode. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.